Okay, so the restaurant's family business, right? Yeah, it was founded by my great grandfather uh, in 1940 in Detroit. Oh, right. so wow. It's one of those old chefs who places. Oh, my God, Detroit. Yeah, yeah. And it runs in his family history too. We were restaurants. Restaurant kids are the greatest. Restaurant food camp. I like modern and more systematic though, you know, with each other. Just keep it. We totally know what it's about, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What Chinese isn't in the Chinese in the restaurant business? The ones that were in the laundry or <laughs> Well we started in the laundry. Yeah. We went from laundry to grocery store and then to restaurant. So we did it all. Laundry, grocery, laundry. Yeah. And restaurant. Because they came like in the late eighteen hundreds. Okay. Yeah. So at the end, what was the hardest among the three? Laundry, grocery, restaurant? I don't know, because I wasn't around. <laughs> but uh, I, I would imagine laundry. That's how we went in. Yeah, on yeah, your back. And restaurant make uh, more money, I guess. Uh, so could, yeah, my dad had a restaurant. If you succeed, if you succeed. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, this is how I know my family restaurant was very successful, was that we owned it for 60 years. Guess how many egg rolls we sold from 1940 to the year 2000? Guess how many dollars? A billion? Yeah. A billion? Like McDonald's? Like 1.2 no, billion. billion? No, no, I think it was not like McDonald's. 1.1 billion. No, but we sold over 10 million egg rolls. We sold like over 10 million. That's yeah, like 4,000 every week. Yeah. It was a really good yeah. popular restaurant. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and, and Spring Row is the, the most popular advertiser for low fun. It's, it's crispy. Yeah, well, we didn't have Spring Rolls. We just don't egg rolls. I like egg rolls. That's deep fried. Deep fried. Yeah. Deep fried. Yeah. Deep fried. Yeah. Yeah. Meet you in yeah. person. Yeah. My it meet? Meet? It's a round table, yeah. so have a seat. What if you I mean, have, you have more people than yeah. you have yeah. chairs yeah. here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll figure that yeah. out yeah. later. Because <laughs> So my family did go through Seattle, so I don't know if there was some Seattle connection or whatever. or Because I've only heard that we did that. So you knew other people that also did the... Oh, okay. yeah, well, our restaurant did it. Yeah, oh. well, ours was in the 1960s. 60, 70, 80, we'd crack yeah, all the eggs. Yeah, 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 no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. There you go, maybe. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people yeah, that's were, yeah, yeah. Thanks so, for saying that. Yeah, that's why it's time to eat. Oh, okay. Wow, this is a spring roll. Yeah. Yeah. We've been waiting for you. Wow. Oh, yeah, you know what? Oh, yeah. And my uncle, they were like, yes, and then they hired us. Uh, I'm, I'm sure more people would have to get a chicken. I'm uh, sure but there's a restaurant in Seattle that has it. We have it. Yeah, you guys had it too? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, there's another chair. Uh, okay, we'll put a chair, but uh, uh, yeah. in a moment. Yes, it's right. Yeah. Did yeah. I kick you white? White? No, no, no. no. I'm floating. Okay. Stick it in batter and then cook it. Because I'm fake. I'm going to kick the whole camera. That's all the problem. And just a bottom gravy. And then you chop it. Yeah, chop it. Penny, would this bother you? No, no, no. I will adjust. One was that Empress. Is it still around? No. They both closed? Yeah. Oh, we have to talk. Go ahead and drag it. We have a pool of customers, which are black people, and basically it's fried chicken, right, with the brown right. gravy and white yeah. rice. And so basically, it's soul food, right? And so that's how that dish came about. That's my theory. Because I told them that, and they said, oh yeah, that's totally, yeah, just go with that. And so I interviewed a bunch of African-American professors, soul food restaurant owners, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese Americans who said, oh yeah, we never served this at home. You know? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah, we never served it at the restaurant. Right. Yeah, it was, you know what I mean? used to have, like, yeah. Traditional Chinese food. Yeah, exactly. But, but in the sixties, nobody would order sea cucumber and black yeah. mushrooms. Yeah, and Peking duck. <laughs> you know what I mean, no, the low fi <laughs> customers. Exactly. Yeah, because our, our restaurant was outside in Chinatown, so then we had to switch to yeah. combination. Yeah, yeah. combination is the thing. Combination A. We used to have a perfection, long life dinner. <laughs> well, you and I, well, you and I will have to talk, although I have to like shut you up. No, 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 <laughs> because no, no, you, no, no. you're sort no, of like defunding my. No, no, no. no, 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 no. He's the foodie. Uh, okay, we we'll have to talk more. <laughs> and uh, the reading that I'm doing for the book in uh, Seattle is actually at a Chinese restaurant. You yes. Know? So that's going to be a lot of fun. So I don't know if it's out. It is not out yet. It's coming out for the summer. We were wondering if we could buy copies of it. Yeah, you can buy it online. That would oh, be really it is great. available. Yeah, it's at Barnes and Noble, yeah. Amazon, stuff like that. I'll, I'll, I'll get the plug in a sec. But, um, so yeah, maybe we should just get started. Sign them. <laughs> yeah, I can send a card. And, and, uh, <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> So uh, thank you everybody for coming to this workshop. Let me do a time check on this because I have an hour. Yeah, we have to be out here five minutes before the hour. Okay, so what time is it now? It is 9.06. Okay, good. All right, so I thought I was going to break this down into two parts, if you guys are okay with that. The first part is actually just talking about the book, 
right? Uh, so it's a little bit of book talk. And then the second part will be talking more of the workshop component, because I'd like to hear back like what kind of projects you guys are working on and why this interests you, because I want to help you all get to that point, whether it's because you guys want to write a book just for your family and to share it internally, or you actually want to try to get published as well and reach a larger audience. I want to be able to help you you know, understand the differences between these different paths, right, and different considerations that you have to make. Does this sound good? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do people want to just go around, since there's so few of us, just say hi? You know, with, you know, hi. With your, just, <laughs> hi. Your I'm Elaine from uh, Phoenix. Okay, great. I'm Susan from LA. Stephen from Poland. May from Mayland from San Antonio. Sorry. And that's it. Uh, also from San Antonio. DJ from Portland. Alan from Seattle. Kevin from Seattle. Cool. Cool. <laughs> it's all like West Coast and South. <laughs> yeah, right. um, okay, so uh, thank you for coming to the session. Um, my name is Curtis Chin. I am, uh, my day job, I do more TV and film, uh, but lately I've been doing a lot more creative nonfiction. Uh, in addition to this memoir that I sold uh, last year, I wrote a piece for Bon Appetit magazine that just got selected for Best American Food Writing. I wrote pieces for CNN, Detroit Free Press, um, Boston Globe. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, I just got hired to produce an episode of America's Desk Kitchen's podcast, Pop Proof, uh, looking at a specific Detroit dish, um, Detroit dish yes. called Almond Gomez Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, lately, yeah, I've been doing a lot more writing, which is focused on the Chinese American experience. Because previously, when I was working to do more mainstream stuff, you know, working for the Hollywood studios and stuff like that, I didn't get a chance to cover anything about the Asian American or Chinese American experience because that's not what I was hired to do. So I would write on these mainstream shows. But as I got older, I just felt like these are the stories that really, you know, resonate with me. Particularly after my dad passed away, I felt like you know there was this um, there were so many stories from my dad's past that I didn't know about, right? That I wish I could have asked him because my family had been in Detroit since the late 1800s, um, and you know, oftentimes we do hear about the stories on the West Coast and the East Coast, but we don't hear about like what happened in the West, and I start off with this joke of like you know how my great great grandfather moved from Canton, China, to Canton, Ohio, before realizing there were Chinese people <laughs> moving up to Detroit and getting a start there, doing the laundry. Yeah, and my family's history, as I would assume with many of you all, if your family's been here for generations, is really tied into Asian American, Chinese American history. We can talk about whether it's the Chinese Exclusion Act or anything, and how it impacted you know our particular families, you know. And so I try to weave a little bit of that into the book, at least in the prologue where I talk about you know, my family's journey here. But for myself, um, you know, as, as the title implies, everything I learned, I learned in a Chinese restaurant. I grew up in this really fabulous uh, restaurant in Detroit. I like to think of it as the best Chinese food. It's like everybody went there. And I, I asked these people who, who arrived early, uh, guess how many egg rolls we sold in the course of the 60 years that we owned the restaurant? 60 years, so must be. Mm. Half a million. 10,000 or half? Half a million. <laughs> really? Yeah, sure. People love egg rolls. We sold over 10 million egg rolls. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. I was going to go higher. But... <laughs> can, I, <laughs> can I have that recipe? <laughs> he has a recipe. He was describing it. He was like, wait, you know, because it's all handmade, even yes. the skin. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. And the sauce was all handmade. It was wow. really, really popular. So everybody from the mayor to you know, the pimps and prostitutes, everybody went to our restaurant, you know, and that was the premise of this book, right? He said, you know, this Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Million. No, it was a lot. We sold like 4,000 every year. Yeah. 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 So the basic of the book is that, you know, so I grew up. A chiman. A chiman. That's a lot of egg rolls. Yeah. They're really, really good. And so actually, uh, as I told people I, I sold this book, so many of them said, oh, you're going to sell egg rolls? It's like I almost feel like I'll do better at selling egg rolls in the book. Because <laughs> more people will buy the egg rolls. Oh, yeah, I got it. I'm here. Sorry. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the premise is that, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Really, really bad times for the city, right? Because we had not just the auto industry that was falling apart. We had crack, we had AIDS. I personally knew five people murdered by the time I was 18 years old. But despite all that, we had this really wonderful Chinese restaurant in the inner city, which my family was able to raise us and teach us really good values. And you know that is the premise of this book. Um, as I was saying earlier, so, so I grew up in this really wonderful Chinese restaurant. And the incident that really changed my life was when I was heading into to, um, high school. Like Before that, I thought I would just inherit the restaurant, just like my dad had inherited it. Because it was a really good business really good food. I enjoyed being there, right? But then Vincent Chin, a family friend of ours, was murdered 
my uncle was his best man, and so like it was a case that really, really impacted me. And one of the key things was that you know we found out that he'd been murdered, like or he had been attacked the very next morning. And so like as any kid would do, you would check the newspapers trying to find out like well what are they writing about it? What are they saying about it? Right? The newspaper did not cover the story for 12 days. Even wow. when this guy was in the hospital, you know, fighting for his life, mm -hmm. nobody wrote about it. Then one paper wrote something, and then nothing else appeared for 10 months, right? And meanwhile, during that whole time, as a kid in Chinatown, everybody's talking about this story. Everybody wants to know all the details, all the twists and turns, but the media just didn't care about the story. And, you know, being a precocious little 14-year-old, I started writing letters to the editor saying, hey, come on, cover the story. But none of them ever wrote anything. You know, but meanwhile, uh, they, because I'm 14 years old, I'm probably not a good writer at that time. But uh, they were writing all these stories about the auto workers, right, and how difficult their lives were, how they were losing their homes, their jobs, and stuff like that. And I honestly feel that if the media had done a better job of telling our community stories, then that judge would not have come down with that sentence, right? There was no way that he would have let these killers get away with murder like that. And for me, that's why I've spent my life and my career really trying to open up opportunities for our community to tell our stories in advance so that people can see who we are before, you know what I mean, a terrible incident happens, right? Because oftentimes, by the time you get to that point, you know, um, where they don't see you as a person, right, or someone with value, then, then they will do awful things to you. And like I always point out, that these killers did not kill Vincent Chin in a back alley. They, did, they killed him on the biggest street in front of crowds of people, right? That shows you how much these guys thought that they had a right to do what they were doing to Vincent, right? And it was not a question in their mind that they were justified. And so to me, it's like, I want to make sure that our community gets our stories out early so that these incidents if they unfortunately do happen, and it seems like they will always be happening, there will always be hate crimes in this U.S., there will always be someone that doesn't like you because of your skin color, or your country of origin, or the language you speak, or whatever. But what we can do as a community is to prepare before that by making sure that people understand who we are, where we come from, what our values are, right, what we believe in. And so that's why I want to encourage all of you to not just tell your story. I know that some of you guys may just be here because you want to write this for your family, and that's great, because that's how my project started off. Like, I was just writing it for my family. But then afterwards, with, you know, the hate crimes happening against Asian Americans, stop AAPI hate, and things like that, I felt like, you know what, this is a story that we really need to get out more, you know. And so that's when I tried to pursue publishing it more so. And so that's my backstory. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have any questions out of that, or I can just read a chapter from the, the book, if you guys are okay with that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll read, how are we doing on time? Uh, 14. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to read first the first uh, page or the paragraph to sort of set up what the book is about, and then I'll jump. I actually never read this story yet. I usually read the Diana Ross Bruce Lee story because that's fun and it's pop culture and stuff like that. <laughs> but because we sort of set this up as a family memoir uh, piece, I'm going to read a story about my mom. Okay, mm, so that cute. made me feel better. Okay, so I'm, this is just how the book starts. Okay. And it gives you a concept of, of what I was trying to do. Because if you are trying to write a book, right, you really have to have a theme, right? What brings people in? Because uh, particularly if you want to write memoirs and family memoirs, um, what I say to other aspiring writers is that we all think that we've had interesting lives, which is hopefully true. We all think we can put together two sentences, which is also hopefully true. But what we sometimes don't think about if we're trying to sell the book is, why is this story important to tell now? And why am I that person to tell that story? You really have to connect it into a larger narrative. And you also have to have a theme where it, so, that, so that people um, feel like they're hooked. They're pulled in. They know the fundamental question of what they want to get to by the end of the book. So I'm going to read to you guys. Hi, do you, do you want us to try to squeeze in? Or, um, so this is the uh, uh, prologue. Okay. Everything I learned, I learned at a Chinese restaurant. <clears throat> Welcome to Chung's. Is this for here to go? Armed with a smile and a red waiter's jacket with perpetual plum sauce stain, that's how my dad greeted any new face who entered the lobby for a popular Chinese restaurant in Detroit. Interestingly, my great-great-grandpa Gong Li Chin had faced the same question in the late 1800s as he stood cold and alone on a rickety dock in Guangzhou, China, trying to decide his future and that of his young, impoverished family. For here or to go? For here to go, as I got older, it was a question I asked myself. Starting in our restaurant's long and open back kitchen, where my family made some of our most popular items, including the tangiest barbecue pork and the best-selling almond cookies, my mom taught me my first lessons. Before, 
Before diving into math, English, and geography, she began with a little history, tales of elders and ancestors, our family as prologue. And so basically, that's the uh, premise that I set up in this book, this idea of like for here or to go. I take a popular thing that you hear going into a restaurant, and I try to infuse extra meaning into it because like, I was struggling as a kid. Do I stay in Detroit, you know, a city that's literally burning down you know, for my eyes? You know, or you know, or stay with my family who I love and this great Chinese food, right? It's a very comfortable world for me. I don't know how you felt as a restaurant kid. You know, you hated it. Oh, my, my, my father, my father always asked me, "Do you like working here?" I said, "No." I said, "Long hours. You smell like." Chocolate. Did your family start the restaurant? Yeah. See, that's the difference. See, my family. By the time I came around, it'd been open since 1940. By then, it already had a customer base. It had all these people that came in. You know what I mean? No, we so were, we didn't feel that. Yeah, we yeah. Were like the first restaurant outside of Chinatown. Yeah, so I can understand that experience. That's why when I say like, oh, I love going for the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> all these other Chinese restaurant kids are like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I really yeah. hated it. So my father would always tell me. Yeah. Well, if you don't like working here, you better study really hard so you don't have to. Oh, <laughs> that's exactly what that's, my husband that's did. That's my he was already working at five years old, busting people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that was my mom's attitude because she didn't want us. They were in Colorado. There were no Chinese there, you know. Yeah. So it was a tough Kind of a tough yeah, those are those you know, are the type of restaurants I love. Okay. <laughs> but homework always first. We got he picked us up from school, do our homework, and then we do the side work. <laughs> so you'll be able to relate to this book oh, because yeah. it's all about that journey of how I moved up from busboy to wait to, to dishwasher to murder. you know, that's my whole journey. But your attitude is different than mine. I am too because yeah. No, I mean, maybe I'm just a more no, optimistic person. No, I I, yeah. I appreciated it after uh, when I was there, I was like, why am I here? I'm gonna go play. <laughs> No, because our restaurant was so successful, we actually had uh, more full-time employees, too, that were doing stuff. And so oftentimes the work that I did was just filling in or the summer jobs or, like, weekends. Like, I didn't, like, it's not like every day. No, we day. had employees, too, but we just had to, like, oh, really? if they're sick or, you know, it's like, man, I could be playing basketball. Well, part of it is that my mom um, just didn't want us to be in the restaurant life because she married into it and she just didn't want us to be there. So that's why she really pushed us. So that is a big part of it is this education, you know, like, um, you know, because my mom didn't grad. This is one of the first things that people always ask me when, when going over the title of the book. Like, so what did you learn in a Chinese restaurant? And I always say, like, you know, the first lesson I learned is that when you're a kid, oftentimes your parents will say, don't talk to strangers. My parents gave me the exact opposite direction. They said, talk to strangers. And who they were talking about were all the people sitting in our dining room. Because my mom didn't graduate high school. My dad went to community college for maybe two semesters. They didn't know what opportunities existed outside those four walls, but they knew that we had this room full of people that could actually open up doors for us, tell us about what you know jobs are out there and things that we needed to do. And so, like any time someone came to the restaurant and had a really cool job, my dad would pull all six of his kids and run over <laughs> and like garage them with questions about, like, well, "What do you do? How much money do you make? What did you have to study?" <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, so yeah. And so that's why I like meeting people, and that's why I like you know. Meeting people that are different, you know, because you learn so much. And also, I learned not to be afraid to ask for help, right? Because that is something, too, is that oftentimes people don't feel like that. But my parents were like, you know, no, ask them what it's about. Ask them, you know, maybe they can get you a job at their company. Maybe they can get you an internship. My dad was very, very proactive. I mean, part of it is that my dad was born in the U.S., so maybe he had different yeah. philosophies my about this kind of thing. My too, because they were both born in the U.S., so. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's different. They yeah, it's like slightly the different. Traditional. Parents of my friends in the valley, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and a lot of their parents didn't speak English. Yeah. So it's totally different. Yeah, yeah. So my parents, um, <clears throat> well, my dad specifically, would have loved one of us to take over the Chinese restaurant, but he also wanted us to know that there were other opportunities, and so he was always, he didn't want to pull us back if we felt like he wanted to do something else. But he definitely would have loved if one of us had taken over, um, you know. But so, um, what I'll do now is I'll read a um, chapter, uh, just a few pages, um, from deep into the book, and then we can then talk about some of the projects you guys are working on and any advice that, questions you guys might have. If we had time, I, I wanted to do a fun exercise, um, you know, a quick exercise about writing, okay, and, and how how to write about family, which is actually a really tricky thing. At seventy-seven, <coughs> I still don't like to write. <laughs> Right. But you have all these memories that are so important oh, to share. Oh, many, many stories, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'd rather tell you and you write it for me. <laughs> well, I can't do that. But this is why I want to encourage this, because I feel like as our community gets older, we have all these <coughs> memories from particularly that time period, pre-1965, before you know, the immigration law changed. So many of us have this history before that 
that is just not captured, right? And I know that people in Mississippi have been doing a wonderful job, yeah. you know what I mean? But like, I think that there are pockets like in Denver and other locations where we just haven't really you know, learned that history. And it's important for us to document it, right? Because we're the ones you know, who know it the best, right? Yeah, so that's, that's my goal of coming to CACA, is just encouraging all of you guys to tell your stories, um, not just for your own family, but for, for our community. I think that's important. Yes, you know, it's sort of hard, though. You know, my family, mm -hmm. have you ever heard of Fong's Garden in Las Vegas? No, I'm uh, sorry. That restaurant has been around, or well, still around, but oh. originally my uh, mom's uncle owned it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I think um, probably in the 50s. Yeah. It started in the 50s. Was it part of the old Chinatown? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Fong's Garden. Okay, yeah. It's very, very famous. Okay. Oh, okay. So I think it's a, um, it might be a, a like a, a monument now or something. Well, I think that'd be a lot of fun yeah. hearing about what Chinese people were doing in the 50s. I mean, did they go to the gamble? Or what? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that them? too. <laughs> you know what I mean? The yeah. same uncle uh, had a uh, pai gao poker yeah. at one of the casinos. Yeah. He, he did that concession. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of But history. did the Chinese on land and stuff like that have a presence? Were they fighting with the Italian mafia for control oh, of no. Vegas? Oh. Like that would be a fun story <laughs> that if that ever happened. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's exactly. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then oh. um, Wing Fong and Lily Fong, they were really prominent people <clears throat> back in those days here. Mm -hmm. She actually um, was a regent at the University of um, Nevada. Yeah, there were a lot yeah. of Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, doing incredible yeah. stuff. So back she in was the, day. the one groundbreakers. Yeah, she just was the one who got the accreditation for that university. Really? It's yeah. really amazing. You yeah, know, all no, our we've done incredible stuff in the history of the United States. Yeah. We've right. broken a lot of barriers. Uh, there's been I have a lot. I just have to write it down because my mother tells me all this stuff, yeah. and then the rest of the people don't know. Is she still around your mom? Yeah. See, how old is she? Ninety-eight. See, you've got to, you have got to. Like yeah, my, my oldest relative is ninety-four, and like he always says, like, oh, I don't remember. Oh, whatever. And I'm saying, no, you do remember. And if you sit down with them long enough, those memories come back. They're there. Yes, we have to write it down. Well, or videotape them. Yeah, yeah. Then transfer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very interesting. Make it a fun it's project. Easier to yeah, make yeah. it a fun project between you and the family. Yeah. 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 My mom started recording my mom. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then she. she Passed away just short of being 98, but she had lost a story. Oh my God! She'd always tell these stories that oh, we never, never told. Exactly. She was born here. She was born in Santa Barbara. Yeah. yeah see, yeah, that's my what I mean. My dad was born in Benson, Arizona, and we had five generations that one that's time. That's what I mean. In Arizona, we hear those stories. Yeah. 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 She's a little girl, yeah. then they, then oh, we went geez. back to China. Huh? Yeah. She looked at the old picture. She remembered the old She was like Japanese lady in China. Then she came to the same back. Yeah. Yeah. They were technically, they were U.S. citizens, you know, and you know, they had the state until they could verify. Wow. It was really cool information. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. didn't know anything. Yeah. 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 for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But you see, even yeah. just sitting yeah. here, yeah. so many of you have these really fascinating stories that I think that not just your family yeah. wants to know, because she was just saying, you know, her grand, or her son you know, was being told all these family stories that her mom didn't yeah. tell herself. Right. And sometimes recording them. On yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. He said, oh, 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 what yeah. happened? And <laughs> yeah. she just started talking, and he yeah. recorded her. So I said, thank goodness he did some of that. Because that's a treasure, and I hope you are sharing that with any historical society that's in your city. Yeah, actually, on my father's side, his, my great grandfather was a <clears throat> entrepreneur and a merchant in Benson, Arizona, because he originally went to to Arizona helping to build the railroads. And then when they had a pause, many of those Chinese immigrants either went back to China or went to California, you know, to... Well, you should go. definitely work... And so, yeah, and he, he had all these... And of course, this Chinese Exclusion Act was in place, so none of those immigrants could interact with any white women or any other. So my great-grandfather ended, ended but, up marrying a Mexican woman. You need to write the stories down, <laughs> but also, more importantly, you should you should reach out to the local yeah, historical so societies and share with them. Yeah. Not just the Chinese-American groups, but also the, the local... Uh, regional people, right. you know, and I know that you were involved with the museums, right? I mean, I'm sure a lot of these places mm -hmm. might be interested in doing stuff. Yeah. Like, I'm co-curating uh, co an exhibit in Detroit right now, uh, partly in conjunction with my book, right, um, on the old Chinatown. And so what we've been doing is we've been reaching out to as many, um, you know, uh, Asian Americans or Chinese Americans that were around in, like in the 30s and 40s and 50s to come in and just record their memories. Mm -hmm. And even if nothing happens from it, they, the museum now at least has this 
uh, oral history archive that you know some historian or somebody will be able to draw back on. So even if you don't want to be a writer, it's at least good to get it on audio recording or video recording because then someone else will have access to it. You know, and those first-hand accounts are so critical, right, in terms of. Um, you know, understanding our history. Curtis, 926. Oh. Let's see if we can get to the exercise. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you said, get me to exercise. No, no, no. I'm like, yes, yeah. okay, I know I need to exercise. Yeah. That's a yes. different issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 It's that kind of workshop. <laughs> it's a workout. Work. Okay. So, um, I don't have any exercises in my presentation. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so the book is divided into uh, three sections of eight stories each, because, you know, you guys are Chinese. You know why. Yes. <laughs> so, like, yes. Eight stories in elementary, middle school, school, eight in high school, and then eight in college, uh, right? Yeah. And it really is that educational journey of going, you know, through that. And so I'm going to read you a story. By the time I get to college, um, I have, I get into this uh, creative writing program at University of Michigan, and it's a pretty elite program. They only take about 20 people in, and I'm the only person of color. Um, and that was one of the struggles, right? Is being the only person of color in these white spaces. <clears throat> you know, and so uh, this is a story from that. Uh, this is after uh, I'd gotten into the program, and everybody's really excited for me, my family, especially my dad. So, okay. One week, one of our waiters was out sick. My younger siblings were busy with their weekend activities, so I was the one called in to help. I jumped at the chance to have some home cooked meals for a few days because I was up at school. I was running around the dining room, refreshing our customers' silver teapots, when a white middle aged woman reached into her oversized bag and pulled out a colorful hardcover. Have you read this book? It's so good. The Joy Luck Club, the recently released oh, novel that featured a bunch of old yes. sassy Chinese ladies who like to eat, gossip, and play mahjong, could have been set in our back kitchen. Every time I came in to help, another diner, usually older and female, cited the most memorable characters, lines, and scenes. They all wanted to know if I was working on something similar. I was writing poetry, but they didn't, they didn't care. To them, all writers were the same. They would, they would squeal, you could be the next Amy Tan. <laughs> My mom. My mom turned out to be the biggest pusher. She rarely had a book in her hand, but the success of the Joy Luck Club convinced her that her life was a bestseller too. She followed me around the dining room, dropping stories from her childhood, the same ones I'd heard growing up, but now she recounted them as if she were auditioning for her own books on tape. <laughs> One night, after, reaching, after seeing how our waiters sometimes pooled our tips together, my mom shared an oldie. When the communists marched south, they targeted my family. My uncles and grandpa were rich in America, so the Red Guard called us traitors. My stubborn grandma didn't want to leave her big home, so when, the, when my parents escaped to Hong Kong, they left me behind to keep her company. The communists hated me and my pulpo. When I was four, they made me watch as they forced my grandma to climb up the old banyan tree in our courtyard. Then they pushed her off into a pile of broken glass. For visuals, my mom rubbed her knees. Another time, standing at the water station, she launched into her own nautical tale. When I was five, my uncle in America paid $25,000 in renminbi, a king's ransom in people's money, to a local fisherman to ferry our remaining family out of China. After a long ride tucked under the planks of, her fish, of his fishy fishing boat, we came up for air. But we weren't in Hong Kong. The trader had turned us into the authorities. In jail, I had to sing communist party songs to earn extra rice for me and my grandma. Another chapter came as we stood beneath a painting of the Chinese countryside. When my pawpaw and I were freed from jail, we found that the officials had given away our home to peasants. We were forced to live several villages away in a dirt hut with three other families. Whenever we went out for a pail of water, my grandmother had to bend low to keep her head below the soldiers. Once again, she gave me a demonstration, this time bowing her head. Granted, my mom's epic sagas, saga interested me. Who wouldn't be intrigued by tales of prison cells, guns, and stolen ransoms? Even the parts about her Monday life in Hong Kong after she reunited with her parents and siblings were amusing. But these were her stories, not mine. She had to tell them, not me. I was in school to find my own voice. I sat and listened, but that was as far as it would go. Toward the end of the summer, as I was back at the back table, sipping my red pop, stockpiling poems for the upcoming semester, my mom sat down. Before I could say anything, she started talking. I was a top student in Hong Kong. When Pepsi came to town, they held a big contest for students to draw a picture of their own school. Mine was the best at Sacred Heart. I won six cases. There were so many bottles, I had to give some to, my, to the nuns. <laughs> I threw down my Parker pen, the one I treated myself to after getting into the program. Yes, and they kept burping all day. It was so funny. You told me that story over and over. And I don't even like Pepsi. I prefer Coke. <laughs> My mom's shoulders shriveled. The shine faded from her rosy cheeks. You don't want to hear my story? I tensed up. I do, but 
I'm behind on my own stuff. Between Drake's, that's where I was working at school, the journal and saving the world, my schedule was packed. On top of that, my workshops in the fall were advanced, still insecure about my place in the program. I put pressure on myself to create more interesting writing by staying up late and scribbling in my notebook every detail of my life. But no matter how hard I tried, working harder could not produce a better poem. My mom lifted her head, herself from her seat. The glint in her eyes orphaned me. Her 42 years of life flashed before my eyes. She'd gone, from, she'd gone from Guangzhou to Hong Kong to Detroit and spent the past two decades raising her six children in a hostile foreign land. She tried to prove her life worth, had worth, that it hadn't gone unnoticed, and here I was, the ungrateful son, writing it off. Her lips quivered in a soft murmur. I hastily picked up my pen, backtracking. Go ahead, Mom, I'll write it down this time. My mom bowed her head as if I were the one of the soldiers holding a gun to her temple, ordering her to sing. You go on, do your own thing. I reached out my hand, but by then she had disappeared through the black swinging door, leaving only the rattling from the kitchen, the clanging walks, and rumbling dishwasher. I sat there, upset at myself for being so inconsiderate. Everything I had done in the past three years had been for her, but it seemed as though I had failed the final test. My education wasn't just to help me get a better life, it was for my whole family. We were a team. We were the eight immortals. How could I let them down? I needed to make things right, but I knew that, like most disappointments in our house, Apologies were never spoken. Only deeds would bring about reconciliation. So, that's it. Wow, I'm guys. <laughs> you know, part of it is because my mom always wanted me to tell her story because she just felt like she had such a tough life, and I always resisted it. In some ways, when I was writing this book, I wanted this to be not just my memoir, but my mom's in some ways. So you really also do track her and the sacrifices that she made, because one of the big arguments is that I didn't want to go to college at that time because, like I said, it was it was Detroit, it was AIDS. I literally thought I'd be dead by the age of 30, right, because Whoa. gay people were dead by the age of 30. I didn't understand the point of going to college, but I ultimately did go. So anyway, that's the book, that's the story. So, um, you know, uh, at this point, you know, um, it's a very simple story, right? It's just about a Chinese family. You know, and all of you guys probably have these really wonderful stories too that you guys can figure out how to share. And so the good news is that the book actually sold. Um, it was a very competitive bidding auction between all the big houses in New York. It sold in three weeks. You know, um, yeah, I already have TV and film people interested in it. I mean, there's a strike going on. But I was telling, like, so uh, Time Magazine, Washington Post, Publishers Weekly all named it to their top books for the fall. Time Magazine is excerpting coming up. Uh, I'm flying back to Detroit to be interviewed for CBS Saturday Morning News. I have to fly to New York to be interviewed for NBC News because they're doing a live show with me. So it's like, yeah, it's generating a lot of buzz, but that just goes to show you our simple stories matter, right? Like, this is just a simple story about a kid growing up in a Chinese restaurant in Detroit. So that's the first thing I would say to all of you guys is your stories matter. They're valuable. You know, write them down. If you have any thought or doubt that, you know, the things that you went through aren't important and aren't going to impact other people, get that out of your head right now. You know what I mean? It's very, very important that you write these stories down. Not just for yourself, for your family, but also for America, you know? Because I oftentimes say, it's like, you know, I want people to pick up this book thinking that they're going to learn just about a Chinese American or Asian American family. But in reality, they're going to learn about America because I weave in so much about U.S. history and other things, you know, about what Detroit was going on at that time. And so, um, with that said, um, maybe you guys can all talk about some of the projects you guys are working on. Maybe you guys have questions. Or if you'd rather, we can jump into a fun little writing exercise that I like to, uh, you know, um, tell about, um, you know, writing the book. Because <clears throat> one of the uh, questions people always ask me is like, so what does your family think of the book? Right? <laughs> so I'm like, well, they haven't read it yet. <laughs> so I have but I do share this one incident that happened because I was in Texas, in Austin, actually, uh, doing one of these advanced uh, publicity readings, and the organizers um, managed to get to the restaurant early. And so they said, hey, why don't you come down and meet us early? I said, okay, fine. So I called the Uber and I went down to the street. And um, I was waiting for my uh, Uber to come, and there's this old Chinese uh, woman standing on the corridor stretching, right? Because it's early in the morning, she's just like, you know, going out her walk. And what she said was, she looked at my shirt, and it said Detroit versus everybody. And she said, oh, are you from Detroit? I said, yeah. And so we started talking, and it turns out that her mom was best friends with my grandmother. <laughs> and so she started sharing oh, all this. I know, right? Yeah. But then she's sharing all these great stories about my grandmother. But then I had to break it to her. I was like, uh, my grandmother doesn't come off very well in the book. <laughs> 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 her opening 
thing lied to me in chapter one is Mo Young. You guys know that? Oh, yeah. And so, like, you know, so I had to tell her, it's like, uh, she's not the, you know. And this woman then no starts, no useless, useless, no useless, no useless, no useless, useless. Yeah. And so she just spent, so, so, like, she just spent the, that few times with me, just constantly telling me, no, your grandma was so nice, she taught me how to drink American coffee, da da da, she taught me how to drink coffee. And I said, look, I totally accept the fact that you may have fond memories of my grandmother, but I don't. She was nice to plenty of other people, not just not to me. Yeah. Right? And so uh, I left out of the way. You know, I did get her number, but then I left. And as a couple days later, I realized that was my grandmother sending an emissary from the grave. you <laughs> 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 The, 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 the summation of that is that regardless of what you think people are going to say about you and how they're going to react to it, even from the grave, <laughs> you're wrong. You just have to go with your own memory about it because that's all you have, right? And it isn't, it isn't about getting the facts right because there is no necessary right or wrong because we all have our perspective on these things, right? It's just important to just get it down. And so don't be afraid that you don't remember every detail. Don't be afraid that you that you get it right or wrong. The most important thing is just to document it. Get it down on paper. And then let other people sort of make the uh, parallels. Let the, let the experts, the historians, the educators, you know, uh, let, them, let them sort of make, uh, uh, you know, headwind it or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's my basic presentation. Um, so, uh, what time is now? 9.37. So, do you guys have questions about specific things? I need a ghostwriter. That's, no. well, that's what I said. No. <laughs> yeah. I can talk, but I hate to write. I want to mention one thing. Um, okay. In Texas, mm -hmm. we have some of the most incredible history about early Chinese. Good. And you don't. And we have a museum that's called the Institute of Texas and Culture. Mm -hmm. And my girl you gotta get some amazing food. a story <laughs> of how the railroad workers oh, yes. and the Persian Chinese, I don't know if they really know what that is, uh, came to San Antonio and created, you know, uh, mm. help Texas and help America. Yeah. And um, the other thing, I, I, my emphasis is to help the next generation mm. to feel proud of what they are. Yes. And part of it, I wrote a book, collected mm. book stories. I, I did hire a ghostwriter, which did turn out. Uh -oh. but, uh, yeah, but they're just doing it for money a long time. They, they were like, mean to me. Oh. But anyway, uh, he, he was mean to me. But basically, what I wanted was to show, even if you come with no connections, yes. with nothing, yes. you could succeed and you could be part of, you know, the uh, landscape of Texas. And uh, this will, I think, help mm. with the current young people who often mm. shy away from being Chinese, mm. but I need to, um, and except other Asians, you know, open-mindedness, it has to be worked both ways. So that's my goal. Okay, and so your project is done, right? I mean, you have a book. Well, she has to do it again. I have to do it again. You have to update it. I started the Asian Festival, which was 39 years ago. And the last major event was attended 14,000 people for one day. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally and my husband and I did it by ourselves mm -hmm. the first few years. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is I wanted to have our younger generation mm -hmm. feel that they have a mission of being good to themselves, understand what they are and be proud of it, and accept others that are different. You know, this, yeah. is, this is the thing that is uh, very key, and um, you know, we have three daughters, and I've always been trying to get them to, you know, interact, and it hasn't been easy. Yeah. Well, so many uh, Asian Americans talk about not learning our own history in, in the classrooms, right? And that's why one yeah. of the big pushes after the rise in reporting of uh, anti-Asian hate crimes is moving through the school systems and making sure that, that Asian American history is included in the curriculum because stories are so important. As I was telling you guys about the Vincent Chin story, right? The reason that that judge gave such a light sentence is because they didn't know our community's story, mm -hmm. right? And that's why you have this push these days to ban books, right? And to mm -hmm. like, you know, shut down diversity offices mm -hmm. because there are some people that don't want to hear that history. 
right? They're scared of it, and what that means in terms of how America needs to be reimagined. It doesn't fit in with the narrative that they want to continue pushing about how America was founded and who contributed the most and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then they are on an active uh, push to erase our history, and so we have to fight back with just as much vigor to make sure that they know our histories and understand, you know, how powerful they are, because it's not just good for our sense of America and 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 understanding the power of this country, but it's also for the individuals in our own community to know that, and particularly for young people, like you said, to have, you know, self-esteem. Yeah, a positive yes. uh, a goal for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that when I first started the Asian festival, mm -hmm. the group that really resented me were the other Chinese. No. Mm -hmm. That happens. Yeah, we had the same really? in Arizona too. There's so many different Chinese organizations, but the festival I'm tied to since Chinese, we've been around for 31 years. Mm -hmm. We present a festival two days and we draw 30 to 40,000. It's a lot of work. And our committee is less than 30 of us mm -hmm. all these years. But, but same thing, we're wanting to get out and share our culture, our rich history, our, our arts and everything mm -hmm. with the general community. You know? And so we, now we get people coming in from out of state uh, to attend our festival. And, and uh, vendors and so forth, so we're, we're growing. It's great to be able to do but that. But see, you have these festivals, up. it's very easy for you guys to set up a booth at your festival and just say, record your history. Spend, even if they only spend 15, 20, 30 minutes, just sit down, just set it up. You know, just have them record your history. Oh, that's it, I'm sorry. Hmm? We're planning our, our, our next festival. I'm sure you can find a young student oh, who can help can. you. Oh, we can. We've got know, a few who that we can. It for you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Good idea. I'm going to mention so in our case, we don't know how to write. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and My we uh, uh, partnered with the Portland State Capstone graduation student, mm -hmm. go to research the mm -hmm. Chinese history mm -hmm. of uh, Oregon. So we published a book, a history book, for 100 years of history. Mm -hmm from 1850 to 1950. And then we came out the book, then we put it on the uh, Costco, so it oh. in three days, all the books. Wow. So we have, still have some book, but uh, that's how we look for help, you mm. know, to do a history book. Uh, so we also have the large chance to show off the Chinese history, culture, yeah. and food. We have the New Year every year at the convention center. You know, a lot of people come and in the 82nd, uh, we have the night market. Mm. That's yeah, a night markets too. But see, that's a, good thing about, yeah. you know. that's a good thing about recording history. It doesn't take a lot of people. Like, you can just have a single camera person. Yeah, you're right. Or just a single person, even just on your own iPhone. The point is just to get it done. Oh, yeah. Just have to have Ken come Yeah, just have Ken. He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't <He's laughs> know how to look for help. But he's doing yeah, that for no, CACA, right? Yeah, like he's yeah. traveling yeah. around. Yeah. And that is part of that yeah. too, you know. Yeah, storytelling is extremely important. Yes. Right? I'm from Seattle. I work on the Wame Club Massacre, mm -hmm. the worst, uh, the gambling den in Chinatown. Yeah. Thirteen people got murdered. Yeah. I, I'm, I was a victim advocate. I was working with the survivors. So when it comes to the time that uh, one of the defendants was eligible for parole, mm. so I talked to the surviving widows. They only throw me out a Chinese proverb. You kill somebody, you redeem with your life. I don't want his life. I don't want him to be paroled. So I, then I said, now this is America. We need to tell more stories about mm -hmm. who the mm -hmm. person is. So I sat down in the living room. The best thing to, to get the stories out is with the seniors is to look at the pictures. Mm -hmm. And they look at pictures, they have family picture. They start telling these stories. How? The daughter got married, nobody walking her down the aisle and stuff. And I listened, and then I said, may I write them down and present those to the parole board? And, and they, they agree, and that is not just a name. Vincent Chin, what does that mean? But the story behind that, and then that parole got denied. And uh, So yeah. I think the time is now to talk to the family members. If we don't write, record them, and I think that's
this already. So here's a, here could building off of what he just said, mm -hmm. if you did decide to do this book, uh, this booth, why don't you have old photos there that might jog their memory, and then you encourage your members to say, bring an elder member and have them, and then you and you could even pretend like, oh, look at this book, yeah. mom, booth, mom, and then they just sit down and say, look at these pictures, and as they're looking at yeah. looking through the pictures. Right. Some things come up, or like, oh, I knew that person. Oh, I also. And we do have a there. photo gallery every year, and, and it, it so it's maybe do it around, every year. Maybe do yeah, it, it has all different, gallery. you know. So do the recording around like that. So after that they've seen the picture, idea. then they can sit down. Yeah, we already did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It definitely definitely works. I was just in Boston, and I had done graphic design. I designed five panels, and we had a booth. We had a video, like a TV set up, and a computer, and then we had pamphlets. Uh, flyers, we had the th uh, the displays up, and it definitely got people talking and coming. So yeah. that's my two cents. Thing is, the majority of the festival goers that are, are not. That's okay. Yeah, capture the, 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 the ones that are there. Yeah, because the, the it's the fine. Capture the few that are working, but is it? So, so, so it, it's really we're reaching out, but but, you're, you know, but if we tell the community yes. that we have this, you know, come in or bring your yes. bring your parents, your grandparents, and we can. But even you know, non-Asian Chinese, so even if they don't speak English, no, but even a lot of non-Asians have friends that are Asians or Chinese. Yeah, they'll they'll be like, oh, I used to go to this restaurant all the time as a kid, and maybe they might say, oh, hey. I heard that they're doing this thing at the Asian yeah. Festival. Why don't you check it out? Because yeah, yeah, people are scared. It's just by getting the word out. I think the story should be some great right. ideas for our next festival. <laughs> but telling your story isn't just about writing. I know a lot of you guys are scared of writing. You know, um, don't be don't be afraid because at least the first thing is at least to capture the story, if nothing else. And you know, there are pitfalls of hiring ghostwriters. It's not that easy because frankly, a lot of people. I, this is probably what you encountered was that these people are just doing it to make money, which is fine. You can't begrudge them for well, it, but they don't have. This was copied work for work for the Oh, and oh. tried to take credit for it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, that's what I mean. It's like they. Mm -hmm. It's a professional thing for them, um, but if you could find, it's actually more important to find a volunteer who's passionate about your story mm -hmm. and wants you to help get it through. You know. Okay. Curtis uh, probably doesn't recommend it, but I would look into ChatGPT AI. Because it's a, just a computer program, you can feed it notes, and it can, yeah, and then you can you can edit the writing actually. So yeah, you don't have to take it word for word, but you can edit the writing. Can I got it wrong? Chat GPT. I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Susan. You guys can have no. Uh, uh, as a member of the Writers Guild, I must insist that you guys have this conversation after I leave the room. <laughs> it's a strike. Y'all cost too much. Okay, I want to put in a plug. But I have been working with the Chinese Historical Society. I've met you before. Uh, Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. And we have been doing a Gamsan journal for since 1976. And so if you go online, either gumsanjournal.com or go to chssc.org and go to Gamsan Journal, you can see and we have been saving stories. And this last year was a Surprising one for us, uh, we did Our Queer Family. Have you seen it? Yeah, I mean it. Oh, oh, that's right. <laughs> 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 well, you know, because I say it's surprising because we've never done anything controversial and the people that are anti-gay, nobody said anything against it. The people that are gay, they never said anything for it. But. We're a sellout, we've sold all copies. I mean, okay. you know, it's part of our membership, but then we also have some oh, extra. Wonderful. And we have <laughs> that, and as well as uh, they did a, um, they did want an oral history project uh, in the early 80s. And it was actually in, to, uh, in partnership with UCLA. And now it's all online. You want to go online and listen in their own voice what people have to say. It's there. And actually, our next issue of Gun Sun Journal will be how, how the whole project got together. In fact, it led to another book called Linking Our Lives, which I would recommend, mm -hmm. which is the story of women and what their experience, experiences were growing up. And it, it was used as a textbook for several years because nobody else was collecting the stories. So, but you know, Susan is a perfect example, is that she's an ally 
So she actually, she used to be the principal at the No, no, not school. principal, but I worked there for 35 years. Okay, she worked at the uh, uh, school in Chinatown. So she has this knowledge of all these people who she can, you know, who she might be able to recommend to talk and things like that. So it's not necessarily capturing Susan's perspective, but because she has access and knowledge, she can point you more to those direct primary sources, you know what I mean, which would be helpful. So feel free to reach out to lots of different people out there who might actually know somebody else who actually might know that history, you know, because they're positioned, so that you can get that. Again, we're talking about first-hand narratives, right, coming directly from, you know, people from those communities, right? But there are allies out there who can point you in the direction of where those stories might be. Like someone could be working at a nursing home and said, you know what, we have this older Chinese American who's like reaching 100 years old. Nobody comes to visit this person, but, you know, they have great stories. You know what I mean? Someone should come and meet this person and get that story. So that's something you guys can think about too. With your crazy schedule, do you, would, yes. you, would you be able to come out to like Phoenix and do a book talk? I am going for us that we could just I am. I'm going to a bookstore called Changing Hands oh, yeah. in uh, December something. I'm going through um, Some of the API is. Equity, Jennifer oh, Charles. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're bringing me out. Oh. Yeah, so you guys can come to the co-sponsor and just bring your members. Yeah, well, 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 no, I would like to have you come out oh. and we will host a book talk where we open up to the community, not just our We've done oh. that. We've done those things before. In fact, uh, Tom Huang, he just okay. had his movie, you know, oh, with yeah, that. Yeah. So he, he came out and we hosted, uh, hosted it and we had about 75 people go to Oh, the wow, that's great. Right. And then yeah. we reserved like that's seven that's or eight that's tables that's and we took them out to dinner. Oh, it was it's very good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was great. We've done it. Okay, we've we'll 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 so we, we like to have things like that and we open up to the entire community, not sure. just our members. Sure, I'll be happy to they, the, And then what they've done, you know, you could bring your books and sell them. I will have my yeah. books, because this is the end of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will yeah. actually yeah. have books yeah. to sell. So we can schedule you for next year or something. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll follow up with you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. I'll give you my contact information. My contact information, the easiest is just info at Curtis. Elementary school name after them. No, this is just this is not on the card. This is my publishers did this. It's just the pre-order. Like if you guys can pre-order the book, that would actually really help me because that determines how much marketing we're going to put in. But it's info at curtisfromdetroit.com. Or you can also get info at curtisfromdetroit.com. Or you can give me your contact I'm going to Seattle on Wednesday the 1st, November 1st. Uh, it's through University of Washington, and uh, I think the CAC. Are you guys helping out? Are you guys one of the sponsors? Me going out to Seattle? He can Or is OCA sponsoring? We're, we're co-sponsors. Okay. So it's OCA and CAC. Okay, I don't know who's sponsoring, but it's going to be at Ocean Star. Ocean Star. Ocean Star. Okay. Ocean Star. I'll be there. Yeah, in Seattle. Yeah, are you in Seattle? One minute. Maybe I could go, but uh, my husband's uncle uh, is here. In oh, so yes. is it? It's, um, I'm going to like 40 the, cities the first, in the right? fall. So. Like, go to LA. So first. Are you in LA? Oh yeah, I live in LA. We're doing two events in LA. We're doing one at Skylake Books, and then the other one is Stop AAPI Hate, you know that big group. Mm -hmm. They actually have offered to throw a, a big event. Well, I guess I wanted to go to Seattle. But yeah. Seattle's nice though. Yeah. But that one is a big community event. Uh, it's going to be October the 27th. You can find all this on my website at Curtis. 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 Curtis is info at Curtis from Detroit.com. Yeah, Curtis from Detroit. Okay, it's uh, 9.55. Okay. Uh,